Go ahead, Teo. Well, thanks, thanks, Chris. I'm very pleased to be here and be able to join this this uh, webinar. And I think we are very pleased to be able to join with you and also in sponsoring it and uh, partnership this in, in this event. <clears throat> Dokumomo US is for the last 25 years advocating for the preservation of modern architecture in America, but we are, have 17 chapters across the states and France organization, but we also are part of a larger international network of Dokumomo, which is located in probably about 70 or 75 different countries and localities. And so we're really very, very pleased to be the discussion today is sort of an outcome of, a, of decades of advocacy. And I hope that all of us, all of you can join us in Chicago in, in the early spring uh, for our symposium, again, talking about preserving modernism. Thanks, Chris. Great, thank you, Teo. And I wanted to, thanks for mentioning conferences too. I keep forgetting that CPF, we're in the planning for our conference, which will occur online in the beginning of June. So I wanted to welcome our first speaker. John, you can go ahead, not John Haver, our other friend, John, can go ahead and turn on your video. There I am, hello. Hi, John, welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for uh, giving us your time and expertise today. So go ahead, take it away. All right, so let me get this going here. Um, oh boy, here we go. Is that working? Yeah, that looks great. Great, okay. So um, yeah, my name is John Eifler. I'm an architect in Chicago. Uh, we've been working on a number of uh, historic projects for, gee, almost 30 years now. Um, I don't really have an exact count of right buildings we've restored, but it's uh, over 20. Uh, but it's not just uh, right buildings. Uh, as you know, there's many, many buildings in need of help. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it keeps us busy. Uh, but today, um, I'm going to talk about um, two buildings uh, uh, that uh, I did very early in my career. Uh, and so I have this also known as things happen when you try something new. And uh, Wright was constantly doing new things uh, in his building. Um, why he did not get sued um, is beyond me, but uh, uh, I'm going to show you some issues with the Jacobs and Willits house that we found while we were restoring them. And it's really pretty interesting stuff. Uh, you can see, I mean, this guy was extremely busy and accomplished hundreds of projects in his lifetime. And it's a wonder that he stayed on top of them as much as he did. Um, so the two buildings I'm talking about is the, the Willits house, which uh, was one of my, well, both of these are early projects uh, accomplished in the 80s. Uh, the, uh, Jacob's house is uh, the first Usonian house uh, built uh, by Wright and is now part of the uh, UNESCO World Heritage uh, building list, thanks to the uh, Franklin Wright Building Conservancy. Um, the Willis House, um, as some of you may know, is one of the first prairie homes built in uh, 1901. Uh, it's a, uh, based on the designs he did for a home in a prairie town and a small home with lots of room in it, two of my favorite titles, but uh, it's uh, very, very innovative. Um, this is the kind of building that hadn't been seen before. And there was, the level of detail was just amazing. Even the planters that you see on the front deck had, had separate water lines taken to them so he could, they could water the, uh, all the plants and all the planters on the outside of the house uh, from a little uh, knob at the basement. So it was, uh, he thought of everything. But um, when we first came upon the house, uh, we, this is right near the front door. And you look and uh, you take the basement window off and there is a large steel column <laughs> sitting right in front of the basement. And you wonder, gee, uh, you know, how could have that, he, how could he design that to rest there when he was, you know, worried about all these incredibly small details in the rest of the home. And lo and behold, it's a kind of gross illustration of a mistake. Uh, but the mistake has a very long story to it and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you there. So the story really begins, this is 
considered by many the first prairie house. It's the Bradley House uh, in Kankakee, Illinois, uh, which I also worked on some time ago with an early owner. Um, and in this house, this is a, a you know an early vintage shot. Uh, he kind of is exploring the idea of space and uh, what these buildings should be. Um, you know, there's not a big two-story space here. This is the living room. It's, uh, it appears fairly low. It's, about, it's a little bit over nine feet uh, ceiling height. But, you know, you have to keep in mind, like all the openings, one room, the next were kept at six foot six. He was very careful about scale so that when, you know, when he keeps the Opening is a little lower, the ceilings look a little taller. And as part of this, uh, in plan, he's working in this living room shown here in the center. It's about 24 by 28 feet in size, which is very difficult to accomplish with conventional wood framing for homes. I mean, the maximum span using two by 10s or two by 12s is about 16, 18 feet. So but he's exploring space and you can see how the rooms, the alcoves, the reception room, the dining room, everything kind of spills over uh, one into the next. So you don't get the feeling that you're in a box by any means. But uh, as part of this you know, exploration of space, uh, how does he get this room to be so darn big uh, using conventional framing? And the answer lies here on the second floor plan um, room 12 in the front is the master bedroom. And there's these little notes and this little diagram to the left. It says detail of truss pattern. You know, here's a bigger detail. And then right around room 12, it says hanger, hanger, see detail. And you see this roof that has been trussed uh, and two hangers come down on either side of the hallway to support a girder that spans from the left to the right. And then all the wood framing, the two by tens, frame front to back. So um, this is how he achieved this, you know, relatively big span of 24 feet. Um, sorry, I'll go back. Um, and but it does leave a room that's fairly odd in proportion. Uh, the wall that he has to use uh, to incorporate the hangers then kind of pushes the space forward. And uh, what's not shown on the plan is a big built-in seat in the bay. Here's the second owner, uh, uh, what was his name? He made birdhouses, but uh, this is his wife in the, in the front room. And it just, this whole bay just kind of dominates this very small room. So it's very oddly proportioned. So uh, within a year, uh, he, his next client comes along, Ward Willits. Uh, and uh, he's again intent on exploring this idea of a fairly large uh, in dimension living room uh, with a bedroom above. And uh, in this case, um, you can see here on the uh, first floor plan in the living room, there's a funny little note that says iron rods from truss in roof. And uh, to the right of that, there's a sign that says flush girder, and to the left of it says flush girder. So what he's doing in this case is rather than running the girder, oh, welcome to Chicago, um, uh, left to right, he's running at the long dimension of the room. Time out. Okay, and uh, so this 24 foot wide room has He's shortened the span with these girders, four feet on the right, four feet on the left, down to 16 feet, which can then be accomplished with conventional framing. And there's a little blow up of it. You can see where the girders were going to run in the long dimension direction of the room. And on the second floor, you can see in the bedroom above, iron rods from truss and roof. And in that little inside corner uh, on, on the porches uh, is where he's got iron rods hanging from a roof that was to be trussed and hanging these uh, girders below. And it also explains to you why the mass of the house is what it is. It's uh, these two balconies, which always seemed a little peculiar, are there because of 
primarily structural reasons. And what he accomplishes by doing this is a room which, um, oh, there's a little blow up for you to see how that front bedroom worked, but you get a room which is proportioned quite nicely. Uh, it, it has depth and uh, it's very spacious. The bed is on the left. There's a seating area out in the window. And the iron rods, though you can't see them, is, are located right behind that light fixture, that wall sconce that you see on the left, or so it was planned. And here we have a shot. We actually uh, have been in touch with uh, the Willits descendants. That's Mrs. Willits standing in her living room. And if you look to the upper right, you can see the girder was installed. Uh, the framing's there, but it, what's a little scary about this, there's no temporary shoring or bracing to support this girder, and the roof has not been built, nor has the roof truss to hang this girder from. And today, you know, we can see that um, there is this room, but these beams are much bigger than what is shown on the plan. So what happened, and evidently uh, this was confirmed by, by the Willis descendants, is the girder didn't work, the hanger didn't work, and what Wright dealt with was a catastrophic failure. Uh, the entire second floor uh, gave way uh, and fell into the first floor, and Wright was forced to uh, install steel columns. They're located in the walls behind the triple wall sconces that you see, and those are inland steel beams in the ceiling covered with wood paneling uh, to support uh, the second floor. And of course, like the Bradley House, the framing runs front to back rather than side to side. So um, who knows who's to blame? It was a great idea. It might just be uh, a, carpet, a contractor who didn't quite get it, but um, regardless, uh, this was a colossal failure <laughs> and uh, probably didn't make him look too good in the eyes of Ward Willett. So there's our steel columns. Uh, then we know the original because there's uh, all the lath uh, for the plaster that was applied to the basement. Uh, oops, is what we say. So the second one is uh, the first Usonian home, the first Jacobs house built in 1937 for uh, a cost of $5,500. Uh, which was a, a, an incredible PR uh, stunt for Wright. Um, the uh, America was coming out of the depression uh, and people were beginning to entertain the idea of building suburban homes. And this house gave him lots of commissions in the future. Uh, and it, it was a very impressive house in its day. It's fairly small, 1600 square feet all these innovations, the carport rather than the garage, uh, turning ones back to the street with uh, a series of clear stories. Uh, it, it was uh, quite a striking house in its day. Uh, and it was also the first home where Wright uh, used uh, radiant heat. And here he is uh, standing. It's hilarious. I've always liked this picture, right? Evidently, he hated the idea the feeling of air coming up inside of his trousers. So he used to tie the base of his trousers uh, so that uh, he would be sealed off, uh, uh, which is shown here. But he's, and nevertheless, he's, uh, he's uh, watching his, what was first a steam system, later converted to hot water. Uh, and you can see the wrought iron pipes um, um, sitting on top of the sand bed over which the concrete slab was poured. And uh, the bricks were innovative. They were actually more or less stolen from Johnson Wax, which was being built at the time. I don't think uh, Herb Johnson ever realized that he donated to the construction of the Jacobs House, but uh, apprentices filled the truck and ran back to Madison. Uh, they were fairly thin um, uh, brick, and they are the same shape, interestingly enough, is used uh, for uh, precast brick face panels these days. The back of the brick is frogged. Uh, and it, what it would do is uh, you'd lay up a common brick back up, and the mortar would kind of ooze out and wrap into these frogged back of bricks, and it would hold on to, to it without the use of metal ties. 
At the corner, they used L-shaped bricks to make it look substantial, which is the brick you see here in the foreground. Uh, but here's the plan. It was built on his two foot by four foot grid. Um, a beautiful little home, three bedroom for Herb Jacobs and I think two children. Um, and and the, uh, one can see the focus on the garden back then. It was uh, actually a vegetable garden uh, for surviving. Uh, the living room was uh, very tall, nine feet. Um, the, uh, not only did it make use of radiant heat, but it was also considered to be a, uh, a kind of a, a passive uh, heat uh, um, uh, solar uh, building in its day. And, but in uh, 1984, when I was called by the owner, Professor Dennis, uh, to take a look at this, it, uh, it looked like this. And one wonders how did it ever get in this kind of condition over time? Um, you could see when walking to the front door that uh, the slab uh, had failed. Um, and uh, well, interestingly enough, the radiant heat, uh, there you can see an original construction shot. Uh, the house was built on a three and a half inch concrete slab on gray. There are no foundations uh, whatsoever in this home. And Wright was clever enough to realize that if he used radiant heat, he would heat not only the house, but the ground as well. So he didn't really need foundations. And in fact, when I visited the house in 84, there was green grass growing in the middle of winter, uh, two or three feet away from the, uh, from the exterior wall of the house. Um, but regardless, you know, our first job was to install a for real foundation underneath the carport supports. Uh, there was no radiant here, so the slab was buckling and there was frost heat. Uh, the brick pier was rebuilt. Uh, we actually managed to get streeter brick to make new bricks for us back then. They're out of business now. And um, a, a bunch of things, this is a, it's a 12 foot cantilever with three feet on the back side. So we used a lot of uh, steel flitch plates, uh, adjustable uh, uh, tie downs on the back so we could adjust the deflection once the loads were instilled. And then we found ways of putting steel tees inside these wooden supports of the fulcrum uh, to hold up the carport. So this is uh, you know, considered by many to be a, a simple home Oh, sorry, I'm gonna go back, there it is. Um, but it's actually, to do it correctly is, is very, very complex and time consuming. Uh, the structure, uh, you can see the fascia kind of steps up. I hope I'm not taking too long here, but uh, they actually went to the, to the trouble of putting little shims to put a crown in the top of the, of the flat roof, which was uh, thoughtful, but what, he never did, or, or the carpenters never did, is tie these three two by fours, these three stacked two by fours together anyway. And so when they were subjected to load, they just kind of slipped by one another and uh, deflected horribly. So what we did as part of the preservation was, was uh, leave the two by fours in place, jack them up above level and put one by tens on either side, glued and screwed. Uh, so that uh, it would act as a box beam. Uh, you can see their rights uh, lighting uh, uh, scheme too. It's kind of a C channel with uh, outlet with uh, lighting fixtures attached. It's very clever. And then there's other things like the closet over the front supporting the roof. There was no headers. Uh, I refer to this as the glass truss. Uh, how this held up over time, I, I have no idea. Um, and so uh, the drawings became very, very complicated, as did the carpentry. And there's, uh, we did very exacting details. This is back in the day of pre-CAD, uh, of how to put this building back together uh, so that it looks like the simple Usonian home that it was. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the other thing that happened was the um, radiant heat failed. Uh, I, this is one issue with right homes that's an enormous problem, and that is all this wrought iron and or copper lying beneath these concrete floors 
uh, which are completely inaccessible. And when they fail, uh, you're screwed. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to take up the concrete floor, install new PEX uh, or, or, or radiant piping beneath them uh, and pour the floor. So uh, this is very, a very nasty problem with many of these Usonian homes. But anyway, uh, I have, I think, one or two slides now. That's my key for Peyton to get ready to go. But the, uh, the house is done uh, and it looks wonderful. Professor Dennis enjoys living here immensely. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the preservation of an idea, I guess is the, <laughs> the way to look at it. It was, it was a tough one. And luckily we had some good people involved, including Brad Lynch. But uh, next I'll take it, uh, uh, send it to you, Peyton, and uh, you can take it away. Thank you. And hello from Pasadena. We've moved from the Midwest to the West Coast. Uh, and we also have a very proud Frank Lloyd Wright um, heritage here. Today, we're going to be looking at two of the textile block houses, the Ennis House and the Freeman House. And to quote Wright, what about the concrete block? It was the cheapest and ugliest thing in the building world. It lived mostly in the architectural gutter as an imitation of rock face stone. Why not see what could be done with that gutter rat? Steel rods cast inside the joints of the blocks themselves, and the hole brought into some broad practical scheme. Uh, it would not be fit for a new phase of our modern ar architecture. It might be permanent, noble, and beautiful. And if anyone is capable of transcending a gutter rat to masterworks of, of design and texture and experience, it, it is and was Frank Lloyd Wright. And both of these houses are, are great examples of that, except there were some, as the conservators say, internal vice involved with those concrete blocks. Just a quick reminder, this is the Freeman House, 1923, uh, a scheme that is, is sort of like an inverted pyramid. It gets wider as it goes up and has this incredible and we think uh, groundbreaking uh, approach of using glass at corners and uh, with, with no mullions. And at about the same time, the uh, monumental Freeman House, which is also on a, on a hillside in Hollywood, but really commands the, the basin with its uh, Mayan-like uh, pyramidal scheme. Um, among the fixations of Wright, and I'll um, give Jet Chusid the uh, credit for this, these words, the concrete house, the affordable house, the appropriate house, and the essential house. Wright did hope that this could become a do-it-yourself scheme where you could cast your blocks in the backyard and assemble your own house. And uh, here's, I think this is La Miniatura based on the concrete blocks under construction in Pasadena. And one of the block houses coming up out of the ground, uh, very much a, uh, a bearing wall house with relatively short spans. Uh, and under construction, we can see the Freeman house at the, the lower right and those large open corners. And then the, the lower left rather than the lower right, uh, blocks fabricated in the field stacked up and ready for assembly. Um, here's Peter Perrins at doing some repair work uh, at the storehouse. I, I think this was done uh, with the owner, of course, and with the late Martin Eli Weil. And those diagrams, if you'll uh, squint and look in real close, and I'll use my cursor, uh, this shows the, the basic plan scheme of the textile block system, which are Two, two sets of blocks with a cavity in the middle. These white circles, because this is a reverse print, are iron bars that were run vertically and horizontally to tie the system together. 
and you can see in the uh, lower uh, right at at the Freeman House, where these are the the, the parts that were made for casting blocks. Uh, these are original, and this is like I, I was thinking like a spring form cake pan, where you you put this together, and then after you pour the block and press the the forms, you can unlock it and take the form away. And some drawings um, of the as found conditions at the Freeman House. You can see that uh, at the Clara stories, uh, how there were perforated blocks that let light through uh, into the house. And I should mention by way of very brief in introduction that um, I've had some involvement uh, in terms of projects at the Hollyhock House, the Freeman and the Ennis houses. Um, and I am a historic architect also uh, emeritus principal architect at Historic Resources Group in Pasadena, and I remain an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, in 1989, here's the um, Ennis House looking pretty fine. It's, it's a little wider than it's supposed to be because rather than concrete, you're looking at a very thick, um, hard, impermeable waterproofing material that was put over the blocks due to uh, the fact that water was coming in the building, not only through the roof, but through the walls when you got a heavy onshore flow of, of rain. And here's the way those blocks are supposed to look. Um, in a protected area at the Ennis House, uh, we have this fine concrete uh, vari variegation on the surface and very sharp edges of the original casting. But only a few years later, 1994, at the Ennis House, um, here, these walls have failed. And you can see that this pattern here that we'll take a closer look at is a delamination of the outer walls of block following a, a uh, FEMA disaster rain season and the Northridge earthquake, which is the largest and most damaging earthquake that we've experienced in Southern California in recent decades. Uh, to the left, uh, the outer wise of blocks fell off of the, the Ennis house. Uh, you can see that there are blocks that are delaminating and cracks in them. Here is a large area on the, on the lower parts of the Ennis house also where you can see original wires or rather the rods, the steel rods that were holding the system together are hanging in air because their blocks have fallen off. 60 years later at the Freeman House, um, these cracks are jacking this expansive corrosion of iron that is pushing the concrete off. And these little concrete rods here are those fillers of grout, which is a, a wet liquid mixture of mortar cement and sand that was poured in and supposed to keep corrosion or rusting of those bars from happening. And also at the Freeman House, um, here's a bit of exposed iron bar that having pushed the concrete off and is destroying the block from the inside out. So a lot of words here, we'll get th through this quickly, can come back and read it later. Here, here the, the sort of the, summary outline of, of fatal flaws. Uh, we have seismicity. We have an unstable hillside. We have a primary structural system, including foundations and retaining walls that is questionable. Uh, block concrete materials composition that's very soft and has salts uh, from the earth that give it this wonderful organic match to, to the hillsides. It's a building growing out of the hillside are the same materials that weren't meant to make concrete blocks. Fabrication methods were uneven. We have a, a crew of men and I don't think any women at that time pressing, mixing and pressing concrete in the field. Uh, irregular pressures, irregular mixes. The textile assembly system incompletely grouted, meaning there were, there were holes between those blocks that didn't get filled. Uh, we have on the surface a lot of acidic deposition, both dry and wet from our atmosphere. 
uh, deferred maintenance, roof failures, and finally failed waterproofing attempts later on that did more damage. So um, here's what it looks like on the right at the Ennis House when the blocks start falling off the building from uh, settlement from ground conditions and also pushing outward. Uh, after the Northridge earthquake, a corner of the chauffeur's quarters at the end of this house fell off the building. Uh, if you can read these lines in the block system, they're not straight because this is retaining on the south side of the building, but not strong enough to retain the earth that's behind it. And a close up on that condition after Northridge from part of the Ennis, Ennis's south wall above the living room fell off. Um, you can see here how bad the peeling on the surface is due to the waterproofing that's being pushed off the building and bringing the surface of concrete with it. And at that time, also in the same area, the area adjacent to the failure is clearly delaminated and ready to fall as well. At the, the top terraces of the Ennis House, we have both uh, expansive corrosion from the steel rebar that that is in, on the perimeter and a, a highly textured surface where we're really losing the profile of those blocks due to uh, weathering and erosion <coughs> from, uh, from lots of acidic compounds in the air, uh, not just acid rain, but acid deposition of dust. And over at the Freeman House, <coughs> after Northridge, the earthquake uh, failed Retaining walls, so the retaining walls were not strong enough to hold the heavy loads of earth behind them. And when that earth shook, the, the walls fell. Uh, these cracks on, on the inside of these field walls, you can see how that, that rebar that's on the perimeter, the steel bars, when it rusts and expands, it breaks the, uh, the blocks in a rectangular pattern. And, and you can see that over on the, the right side here in this, this pattern of circles here with the concrete pushed out, that is a corrosive, uh, a corroded iron reaction, whereas these uh, shear cracks, which are diagonal, are the result of the Northridge earthquake. So there's a lot going on here and none of it is good. Uh, there were people inside the Freeman House during the Northridge earthquake and they, they awoke in the middle of the night to parts of the house falling in on them. Uh, surface conditions, at, you can see how we have erosion and we have some biology as well. The black stuff is not just soil, it's uh, growies. Um, so seismicity, we need soil, soil stabilization, groundwater management helps. We need additions to foundations. A primary structural system design, we, the building needs some help just to stand up in, in the face of, of seismic forces. Uh, composition of the concrete, um, find out what it is, assay sam samples, um, discover that they're decomposed granite from the site and they're chlorides, meaning salts, inside the concrete, uh, which means that you, you have a you don't have a strong concrete that protects the rebar. Uh, test the compressive strength, it's low. Uh, look at alternatives for treatment. Do you replace with a better block? And then you have this uh, conservation challenge about making the building strong and safe versus a conservator and a historic architect's concerned about, about both the integrity of the blocks, their original Frank Lloyd Wright blocks, and the compatibility of a strong block and a system of weak blocks. If you take out, if you have a broken block and you put in a really strong block and the building moves, the strong block will break the weak blocks. Uh, maybe you have a supplemental structural system to some something to hold the building up in addition to the blocks. Uh, on the outside, just to prevent the continued weathering and erosion, uh, there are some consolidation methods where we might have retreatable uh, liquids that we can put on the concrete uh, and so that they don't do permanent change and maybe even some cathodic protection using um, let's say electricity so to speak to help prevent our bars rebars from uh, eroding further. 
Um, one of the interesting observations is that the plain blocks are much stronger than the textured or profile blocks because they were just easier to make and the pressure to compress them were was much, much more consistent. Uh, but there were variations. So it's difficult to remove an individual block because of all of that rebar. And then when you think about the problem of putting in, you might say, well, it makes sense to put in a stronger block, doesn't it? But one of the problems with that is not just that a hard block will break a soft block, but what happens 50 years from now or 100 years from now? How, if that new block is different in composition than the old block, how is it going to age? Is it going to age into matching with the old blocks? Not if it's not of the same composition, but that composition is not too good, is it? Then thinking about other creative solutions uh, in terms of repair rather than replacement and aesthetically reintegrating the surface of original blocks. If the block has some structural integrity, what about putting a mask on top of it that we can take off later that makes it look good even though it's just makeup on the building? Um, for treating uh, the surface of, of concrete, we have some other uh, technical tricks too. Uh, among them is reverse carbon, carbonation through using poultices to remove salts and uh, electrolytic solutions to realkalize the concrete so that it's not uh, acidic but returns to an, an alkaline type of compound. And just consolidating the surface to, to slow down the erosion. Um, the, that that material, which is a product called tough hide or tough coat that uh, Gus Brown put on the building. And we don't hate Gus for trying to save the building, but it was a very bad thing to do because it's a very tough material and it doesn't stop the salts and the water from migrating out, pushing that coating off. And when the coating peels off, it brings the surface of the concrete with it because the concrete is disaggregating and very soft. So getting close to the end, um, here's a, just, this is how bad it got before it got good again. Uh, in the 2006 project completed by the Ennis Foundation before its later sale to a private owner at the Ennis House, uh, the, the entire motor court was removed and the foundations were, were augmented and, and rebuilt and the entire motor court had to be reconstructed because it was not safe. And at the, the Freeman House, the project that, that USC completed uh, after that involves a, a really fancy structural augmentation where this is a, a diagram of the Freeman House, the, the street being uphill at the top and downhill at the bottom, starting with concrete uh, caissons, which support uh, a grade beam, a grade wall really, which supports a reinforced concrete <coughs> slab uh, which further supports um, with these caissons here, four concrete piers that with trusses that are making a moment frame that the upper structure is tied to. And then at the very top, there's a long row of concrete caissons, which you can see over here, set below the street and a grade beam that the building is connected to at the top. So it's supported from the bottom, it's connected at the top. I don't think the building is ultimately safe from seismic damage because of the walls, but it's greatly stabilized. It won't fall down the hill. There will likely be much less seismic damage in the future because there's much less movement due to this seismic stabilization. And here's that some of that work in progress. And just uh, remembering of some of John Eifler's uh, talk about how hard it is to build these projects. At the Freeman House, it sits on the street. There's no way to, to get a vehicle to the back downhill. So all of the equipment and materials and workers, not workers, but all of the materials and, and machines had to be craned over the building to the backyard to get this work done. Um, recommended reading, uh, Jeff Chusid. Uh, with whom a lot of this presentation was assembled a decade ago and his award-winning book, Saving Right, 
the Freeman House and the Preservation of Meaning, Materials and Modernity, and a, a, a pretty good list of the basic people and firms uh, who taught me what little I know about concrete blocks and Frank Lloyd Wright. So thanks to them and thanks to you for attending. And I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Peyton. I really appreciate that. I wanted to just, um, uh, our other panelists can go ahead and you can start your videos, but I wanted to share, now I get to be in the hot seat. Uh, I wanted to share real quick, a lot of you know that I'm actually in Florida right now at my 1980, 1959 A-frame, but I wanted to show you real quick, there is a, um, that in Florida, it is actually, we have the largest collection of, single collection of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in the world at uh, Florida Southern College. Uh, he designed 18 structures, 12 were actually built. You can see my screen, right, John? <laughs> I always want to double check. Yes, uh, I can. Okay, so <laughs> at Florida Southern College, it is the single largest single site collection of Wright architecture in the world. They do have a number, uh, here's one with Wright with the, mink stole or the fox over his shoulder, which I thought was a little funny. Um, and yes, uh, Jones in our chat room, it is as amazing as it sounds. It's a it's a wide open campus. This here is the uh, Annie Pfeiffer Chapel. It was the first building that he constructed there, 1938. So this campus was under construction for more than 20 years. Uh, here's a picture of the building now. It has a lot of the same issues that you two have talked about with falling, uh, concrete uh, textile blocks that are a little soft and don't really hold up over time. This is the interior of that. The buildings are closed for the moment, uh, but I think everything when it starts opening up, everyone should make this a bucket list on your tour because there are so many different Frank Lloyd Wright buildings here. They are late period, so it's a little bit of a different approach to his work. You see a little bit of everything. So this is actually three images put together. They did this really delicate um, these perforations in the concrete and each one has a different colored glass in it. And that's the stained glass in the chapel. Uh, also here, this just like in the other uh, Frank Lloyd Wright buildings that we've noted has a very low ceiling and you will hit your head on this. Uh, if you're anything over five foot uh, seven or five foot eight, this is one of the, the colonnades that he created. And they do have a visitor center, which is uh, relatively new, but it's created from a Usonian um, house plan, and then there was some in the in the chat about uh, Usonian. I put a couple of things, uh, PDFs I found. So th this is a Usonian house that you can visit. It's a, it's a recreation, but it's something you can go visit. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, we're getting calls here. It's very busy. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually worked with this uh, Florida architect named Neil Schweitzer, and they uh, got the students to work on the project. So the thing actually rose from the ground, from the very floor to sand on which it was constructed. The students did a lot of the work which led to some of the material issues later on. Now that the uh, site is almost, I guess the first building is, is about 90 years old. Uh, Neil Schweitzer also worked with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright on this, the Spring House, which is in Tallahassee, 1954. So we have these Wright buildings all over the country. I just wanted to note that we do even have some here in Florida. So I think we're ready to do the q and I don't know if Teo is still with us, but you can go ahead and turn on your camera as well. Uh, so did you want to start the, I have a question to start and then I'll let John take it away. So Teo, I have one I think that you can answer in particular. Raymond Neutra was in the chat room. Hi Raymond. And he had a question about um, the radiant heat. I mean, all of you are welcome to answer this, but maybe I'll just start with Teo um, as the author of the Preserving Modern Architecture book. What kind of approaches would you give someone who has radiant heat in a historic modernist structure? I, I think that's a good question. I will kick back to John because he seems to have answered that very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no real option for that except going into the slab, correct, John? Well, there is one other option and I have yet to do it, but um, I learned of uh, a, a cooling uh, warehouses in California that had two and a half inch diameter wrought iron pipe. And they actually managed to pull uh, flexible, I think it was polybutylene piping through the old piping like it was conduit. And uh, they then, uh, it was cooling in this case, but they managed to reactivate it all 
I think you could do the same thing for, uh, for only those radiant heating systems that use wrought iron pipe that have radius ends. You could send a mouse through first, you know, on a wire and then pull this polybutylene piping through it. That's a possibility, but I have, <laughs> I have yet to see anybody do it. So there's a potential there, but that's it. <laughs> I had two cases of radiant heat and I, the unfortunate part of me had to go in the slab. So there was really no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's not good. Oh, I see Raymond commented. He said, my question was when the repair is made, how do you do it in a way that subsequent repairs would be easier? I guess you kind of addressed that. Well, so, yeah. Go ahead, John. Now, it, it's, it, it's a problem. I mean, if you had all the money in the world, uh, what you do first is put down a uh, conduit of some kind, just like electrical conduit, and then pull the radiant piping through it. So that you could, if it if it were to fail, and they say that the new radiant piping lasts forever, but I don't believe them. It's water oxidizes material, and it will fail. Uh, and when that happens, you you pull the old uh, the the new radiant pipe out and replace it. That, but no one has that kind of money to spend on their heating system. So there has been a few questions about um, structural. Uh, the, the one that was voted the highest was the one that I wanted to ask. So I'm actually glad that our attendees voted for it. Um, it was uh, from Betsy. She's saying, what are the most common pitfalls when restoring Frank Lloyd Wright buildings? And how do historic building codes assist with balancing architectural integrity and structural integrity in seismically sensitive areas? Uh, this is Peyton. First of all, you need a really experienced creative structural engineer. Uh, don't, don't get an off the shelf guy who, who doesn't think about how to solve problems the way that John has done uh, at, at his houses. Um, I'd like to point out that, you know, that the International Existing Building Code has provisions for existing buildings that give owners and engineers a lot of flexibility. And here in California, we have our California Historical Building Code, which is a, a part of our state building code uh, that gives, uh, again, a, a lot of, of flexibility and approach and performance standards to owners and historic um, of buildings and the engineers and the building officials to, to look at different ways to solve problems uh, while deciding on what level of performance is safe for the people and for the building. Great. Um, and to follow on that, I, I maybe I'll, I'll continue that with a question that I had, which was about uh, resiliency and, and maybe look at a little bit at the philosophy of Wright. And did he perceive or do you think he perceived what the situation we would be in with with climate change, with uh, natural hazards? Um, I mentioned that because uh, I posted in the chat box a link to an article in Metropolis Magazine on Okatia Desert Camp, which was the precursor to Taliesin West. And um, apparently the, the article has a bit to say about uh, right building sort of in a floodplain in the desert where you have perennial uh, water intrusion. So I'm wondering what your thoughts were on that. Um, I, I, I welcome John and anyone else to comment. Having you know had the pleasure of visiting um, Taliesin West many times, not not Taliesin, um, I haven't noticed a, a flooding problem with the buildings per se. Um, you have to note also that this was a, um, a a winter residence, and there was a whole summer residence uh, uh, at Taliesin. So the the um, the climate performance of Taliesin West in the summer is not too good. There have been a lot, a lot of uh, retrofits to make it make it bearable, but when the school was operating, it it uh, there was a mig two migrations back and forth uh, from cold cold to hot and back to cold again. Uh, but certainly the the um, that the concept of the Taliesin West buildings were were really fancy tents with with canvas canvas roofs and and meant to be indoor outdoor experience that was I think moderated by the design of the buildings and, and meant to be not a highly mechanized environment and certainly used lots of on-site materials. 
I think I'd like to add to that in more general terms. I think you'll be, we keep forgetting that most architects in the late 40s, early 50s were much more conscious of the environment than we are today. Because if you look at the <clears throat> domestic air conditioning, it doesn't really come into place until the end of the 1940s. And so they're there for the design of a building that's far more conscious of its environment than we actually are ex expecting today. Whether that means that they were conscious of floodplains, I'm not quite sure, but I would think that, again, given history, people were pretty clear about floodplains. I think it really is more and more in our own time that we're beginning to ignore these things. Thank you, Theo. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, Theo has a good point. I mean, when I think of you know the Jacobs House say, and the clear stories, all of which were operable in the kitchen, the hot air would rise and escape the building, and uh, as were the odors of cooking. I mean, he was very conscious of, uh, of, of how air, you know, and ventilation and natural light work through a house. Uh, and that, uh, to some degree, I think has been lost these days. Well, I think that the, our perception of comforts are different. I think we think comfort is 68 degrees or 72 degrees. Well, probably for Frank or Gwydy, it would have been 82. I, I'm making up the numbers, but <laughs> again, it would be much more equalized because of the capabilities of the house, but it probably would be higher than we would expect in today. So I think it's partly our own expectations versus their expectations. Hmm. Perhaps. Right. It's kind of like how they say pour red wine at room temperature, and room temperature nowadays is way too hot <laughs> to serve your red wine. Uh, similar to that. I don't think we could talk about Frank Lloyd Wright without talking about really the value of even some of these, um, you know, the, the blocks and everything. I wanted to talk about security of a historic structure. I have been to a couple of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, I won't say which ones, that have um, very poor security and have suffered some losses of material. What do you three think is the best way to actually sort of secure the, the sites while also allowing public access. Hmm, large dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I know at, um, you know, I'm sitting in front of a, a nice picture of the Gamble House, uh, which is, I, I think, one of the better operated and curated historic house museums in America. And uh, for, they have lots of security detection uh, and nowadays that's easier than, than it used to be because uh, it can be done wirelessly on the outside and the inside. And some, some very practical common sense things. Uh, there, there are always two USC fellows who, who sleep in the building. Fellows is a nice word for uh, we sleep in the staff quarters and watch the building all night long. And one of us pulls our car into the driveway and leaves it there so that you can see that there's someone here all the time. Uh, uh, during tours, um, uh, according to the rules, there, there are never more than 10 people in the house on tour at, at one time. And they, ha they have a guide and a docent and they have a rear docent who is watching the people from behind because there have been people who have tried to uh, detach pieces of the gamble house during tours. I, yeah, I would like exactly. to say one thing though, Christine. Okay. The, the Seth Peterson Cottage, when uh, that's another project I work on, Audrey Latch was the kind of the brainchild of it. And, you know, she was the one who was advocating opening the house up for rental. Uh, and, and it kind of gathers its own funding in that way. And that has been in operation for what, 35, 40, 35 years. And they have yet to have a problem with vandalism or theft. So, you know, I, I know we all like to you know, protect what we have. And, you know, the biggest problem that I see is people putting cover glass over their art glass, which just destroys the look of right, right, old right homes. Um, but I, I, I think to some degree, you need to take some risks. Um, shit happens and, you know, you, you, you fix it when, when it goes bad. That's a great point. And, and on that note, <laughs> on uh, shit happening, um, and, and we don't have to worry about the FCC here, so uh, we're, we're fine. Um, but uh, on, the, on that note, there was a question about um, 
the uh, Ennis House, the Minatura, the Freeman, and the Storer, um, all of which uh, have concrete blocks, according to the question. And, and they're wondering if this is a common problem with all concrete blocks of rights. And uh, maybe Peyton and John and Teo, to an extent, can um, respond to what, what was the issue with these blocks that made them different from other uh, types of concrete? Uh, they were, the blocks were because of Wright's, um, you know, extraordinary creativity and desire to explore new things, which as John pointed out is a kiss of death. Um, uh, they, the blocks were, were composed of sand from the site that had decomposed granite and marine salts in it. Uh, you don't put salt into the concrete mix. They were made on site, not in a factory, by hand, by crews who uh, maybe one guy was a little bit uh, hung over that day or certainly didn't, wasn't as doing as well in the afternoon as he did in the morning. Uh, the, the pressure was uneven, as I pointed out. The, the compression and the compressive strength of the flat blocks is more than the, it is of the profile blocks. Uh, so we, we have blocks that have low compressive strength that don't hold up well when they, when they have rusty rebar in the system. That's a big part of the problem, not just the concrete itself. Yeah, and the way these blocks are formed, I mean, I worked on uh, one or two in Galesburg, Michigan from much, a much later time than the NS. But uh, when you look at the profile of a block, I mean, that steel is maybe a half of an inch away from the outside face of the block at a joint. And so driving rain or whatever, it just runs down the wall and it's a beveled block and it just invites the water into the joint. Uh, I mean, typically rebar should be at least an inch and a half, two inches away from the outside face to prevent oxidation. And so the block, uh, the configuration of the blocks are set up really to encourage steel to rust. And in my opinion, it's just a, a horrible way of building. <laughs> building. Right, but it is also a desire to not stagger the joints in masonry. And so as a result of that, because he wants the vertical and horizontal lines very clear, he's got to put the rebars in. And, right. and everything cascades from there, having quality controlling and concrete cover uh, being, in, being inadequate. Yes. But it starts with aesthetics. Right, right, yeah. Uh, all right, thank you all. And I wanted to mention, Teo, you have some of, of your fans from the from Pratt, class of 16, I think somebody said, or talking about you, uh, Andrew, I believe his name. I lost it in the chat anyway. Uh, so you have friends out here who are, are interested in this discussion. I wanted to, yes, Teo, do you want to say something? They're on spring break, so they don't have to take my class this afternoon. <laughs> exactly. So they, they have time. Um, we still have a couple things in the chat, but it's time to wrap it up. So I wanted to uh, thank all of you for participating today. We really appreciate you bringing your, your long experience with Frank Lloyd Wright buildings uh, to our webinar. So thank you so much for that. Um, before we leave, I know John is going to post a, um, a link in the chat about a survey if you want to give us some of your comments. And please come back and see us on Thursday evening. We're having Modernism and the Sexual Revolution. And that starts at 5.30 on Thursday. It's one of our happy hour events. So you can bring your cocktail or your mocktail, whichever you want. And uh, that'll be 5.30 to 7. It should be a lot of fun. And we, will, we have the information on our website, californiapreservation.org. And also we encourage you to donate and join our organization. Do you want to wrap it up, John? Yeah, and just to repeat our thanks to U.S. Modernists for their sponsorship of this program and to Docomomo U.S. for their partnership with this program. Uh, with that being said, I have a link in the chat box. I'll repost it so that you can let us know how we did today, and I'll share that with the speakers anonymously so they know how they did. Um, and uh, thank you all for your time today. We look forward to seeing you in the remaining parts of our five-part series. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. All right. Take care.